Welcome to the Nourish You podcast, where we question the traditional model of dieting and nutrition and focus on choice, fun, and health for the whole mind, body, and spirit. I'm Jana Maurer, a non-traditional registered dietitian and well-being expert, and I want to challenge you to take 2% of your day today, listen to this episode, and make this your health win for the day. Pop in your earbuds, strap on your walking shoes, or pour a big glass of wine, whatever you need for today, and tune out the world as much as you can for the next 30 minutes, and let's fill up your cup. All right. I am so excited today for the Nourish You podcast. We have Amanda. Amanda is a um, private dietitian as well. And she's been a dietitian for over 20 years in so many different arenas of dietetics. And now she has her own practice. So I'm going to let Amanda introduce herself and share a little bit more about what she does. Yeah. Thanks, Jana. So happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me to your show. Such a blessing to be able to connect with you and support um, your audience too. So yeah. So welcome everyone. My name's Amanda. I support uh, men and women who want to let go of restrictive diets and lose the weight for good. Um, as Jana said, I am a seasoned dietitian and I just love working with a variety of people um, to help them adopt a more sustainable way of eating. My approach is really an all foods fits approach as long as it is safe for you. So I try to open up the possibilities that exist in mind, body, and spirit um, so that people can really live their healthiest lives. I'm also a mentor and a coach, a business coach to other young RDs who want to get started in their private practice and learn to grow a sustainable practice that they they can love and enjoy. So that's a little bit about me. Love it. And if you're tuning into the Nourish You podcast, you will see a common theme, especially with other uh, dietitians, is when we really get into the dietetic space, um, seeing this theme of all foods fit. And I love how you added as long as it's safe for you. Um, but really getting away from that restrictive aspect of what is typically taught to us is nutrition, um, which really isn't nutrition at all. Like, I, you know, like I shared before we started recording, that's really marketing. It's not nutrition science. Um, but today, Amanda, you and I really are going to dive into that mindset aspect that is so crucial for anyone on their health journey to be able to make it sustainable. So it doesn't feel like it's so on and off or more of that yo-yo aspect mentality. So let's just dive in. So from a mindset perspective, what do you think are some of the key, you know, thoughts, beliefs, understandings that someone should really have if they are wanting their wellness journey to be something that they get to experience for the rest of their life? For sure. Um, you know, there's definitely, I always tell, you know, clients, especially when they first start with me that, you know, old habits die hard. And so you're always going to have those old thoughts and um, really just limitations around your thought process around dieting and nutrition. Like what is nutrition, right? Like what is the best way to eat? And it's those diet thoughts are going to come creeping back in, but there's three main things that I always like to get started with new clients on and really help them pinpoint. They could start pivoting the conversation that they're having with themselves when those old habits start creeping in, right? So um, if we want to stay consistent, we can do these three things. And I'll start with just number one, as we just get into it, is ask yourself, right? Am I taking an all foods fits approach? Um, or am I drawing a hard line in the sand? And am I, do I have an all or nothing mentality like around food and right around your journey, right? It just extends beyond food. And so, um, again, just circling back, I always tell my clients like all, all foods can fit if it's absolutely safe for you. And what I mean by safe for you is we know in this day and age, as we increase awareness around um, food intolerance, food sensitivity, and certainly food allergy, that there may be certain foods that are considered healthier food options that might not be healthy for our bodies. Yes. And that is something that, you know, we need to approach that on an individual basis. So, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, leafy greens or, you know, I add spinach to my shake every day. You know, it's really healthy. Well, for some people, right? Spinach could be something that they're sensitive to, including myself. Like I right. found out most recently going through this process of food sensitivity that it can't have spinach. So it is, we can make all foods fit if they are indeed safe. 
there's a lot of misconceptions around there in the diet industry that, you know, we should eliminate certain foods because they're healthier. And there's really not evidence around that to support that. Gluten is a perfect example of that. Like that everyone should eliminate gluten. Gluten generally makes everybody bloated, um, causes, you know, water retention. You know, we should just get rid of it out of our diets. Is that true? Is that true? Or does the thought of that restriction just cause more anxiety and make your journey harder? Right. percent. So can we let go of some of those disbeliefs? Can we let go of drawing a hard line in the sand and adopt? an all foods fit approach. Again, embracing all foods can make us less anxious around the journey and can make us feel like we have more options available to us. And that in turn is going to create consistency. And we know consistency trumps perfection like any day of the week. (laughs) We don't have to be perfect with things, right? Like what is that anyways, right? Right. Like what is perfection? (laughs) Can we just have it like, we know there's nothing in this world that is perfect. Mm -hmm. It just does not exist, right? But how many people try to attain perfection every single day? Mm -hmm. No, we hold ourselves up against that standard. So ask yourself, am I taking an all foods fits approach? And if you're not, how can we start to shift that? Well, one is with foods, you know, meal prep, for instance, right? Do we have to prepare seven days worth of meal prep on a Sunday for four hours? Yeah. Like, I mean, Jana, like, I don't know about <laughs> you, but I cannot be in my kitchen for four hours. No. And, yeah. You know, and I love to cook and bake and I'm not a recipe blogger, but I just have a passion for cooking and baking. But do not get me in the kitchen for four hours. Like, can I break that down, you know, in little increments throughout the week? And can I take it little by little, right? Yeah. Almost like, a, you know what I mean? Like almost like a 1% better approach. Drop the all or nothing mentality, right? Yeah. Well, and I think it's so, oh my gosh, I love that you say that of spending four hours in the kitchen because like when we think about meal prepping or planning, like that's what we envision. We envision usually like, chicken, rice, and broccoli and spending four hours in the kitchen. And frankly, like if we, I always, you know, like with my coaching clients, I always like to say like, what don't you really like? Like what part of it, like, do you like, and what part don't you like? And nine times out of 10, it's not the actual like cooking process that we mind. It's the dishes, like all all the dishes that come from meal prepping that you have to clean and put in the, like, I mean, that is part of the time that you're spending in the kitchen. So like, if we're trying to make it work, like how can we one really understand what aspects work or, or don't work for you? And then how can we make it a little bit more simple to be in, to be able to engage with it initially, right? Like we're looking at, okay, what habit do we want to establish and how, what is the easiest way? Or, you know, some people don't like to say easy because it's like, if it's easy, then you're not doing it right. So I was like to shift and say like, <laughs> right. in what way can we make it simple when we're first starting out to actually want to engage with it and be able to repeat that behavior. That's really the goal. So I love that you highlight that because it's so true. Like we don't want to spend four more hours on the weekend when we're just like dead tired. Like that's not something that most people want to do. So yes, so true. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, again, talking about things that we take a hard line with that extend even beyond food that impact our journey to be consistent. Fitness is a big part of that too, right? So a lot of people feel like, you know, if I can't get in an hour workout, then, you know, heck with it. I'm just going to forgo the workout and, you know, go on with my day. It's a lot harder to reach your goals and achieve some con- type of consistent exercise regimen with that type of all or nothing approach. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if we can kind of make like, you know, a 1% better type of pivot there with, you know what I mean? With our thought process. Okay. Can we get on the treadmill for 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. Can we get outside and walk the dog for 10 minutes? You know, can we lift weights for 20 minutes? You know, can we, like you said, like repeat that process Is the process repeatable. And it is, is it also like adaptable and flexible because tomorrow you might be able to get an hour in Mm -hmm. whereas today you didn't, but today still counts. So it's like embracing all those little things, you know, that, that, that count. The other thing is, um, 
that I see a lot with clients is what I call um, sleep hygiene or a bedtime routine, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we may find that, you know, someone's not getting enough sleep. So many people are surprised to find out. And I don't know if you find this in your practice, but the average American, uh, um, I'm sorry, the average adult needs seven to nine hours of sleep a night um, to achieve optimal health and function properly. Mm -hmm. I know that I'm a bear. If I do not get eight hours of sleep, <laughs> just look out, you know, yeah, I'm going to be hard to deal with the next day. The, the next day is going to be very challenging for me. If I get five or six hours, I know that about myself. And so a lot of times um, I'll work with clients to, um, you know, improve their sleep hygiene, get to bed, maybe a little bit earlier, you know, uh, wake up maybe a little bit later you know, develop some type of bedtime routine. Again, it's not taking, well, you know, I got to bed, you know, I wasn't able to achieve those uh, sleep hygiene goals this week. So, you know, what's another week, right? Mm -hmm. Just like throwing it all out the window. Right. And we say, if we're able to get, you know, three out of seven days in, is that a start? Right. You know, right. Yes. So I always, so I played sports, uh, growing up, like I just grew up in a, a family that was, you know, really competitive and everyone played sports. And I always like to share that one point wins the game. So if you have one day, like if we're referring to like the sleep hygiene aspect, if you have one day that looks better than your baseline, you won the week, right? Like you're still moving forward. And, and when we put it in that context, it's like, oh yeah, like one point does win the game. Like you become a champion if you win by one point. And that's what we're really looking you know, to do is that 1% aspect, like you highlight is being able to give ourselves that. Are we, are we having that progression versus that perfection? That mm -hmm. is so key to having like a mindset that it keeps you in really abundance right? Like it keeps you giving yourself credit one, it gives you credit for what you are doing. And it gives you credit yeah. for taking that first step to move forward, which really builds up our self-confidence of like, I can do this. So now you have that one night, how can we make it two nights? Right? Like mm -hmm. and we keep building from there because it really, it just allows us to really, um, see the big picture versus being, you know, set in that micro aspect. And when we're in that micro focus, mm -hmm. everything feels just so wonky. <laughs> I always share like, it just is like, oh, it's like too much. But when we're able to really set back, expand our view, we can take in all the different aspects that make up our, you know, our wellness plan and see, okay, like I am making these decisions that are of, of healthful practice to my overall routine. So I love that. Mm -hmm. Love that. Um, okay. So we have get rid of the yeah. all or nothing mentality. Yeah. Get rid of all like the mentality. 1% aspect, mm -hmm. um, really looking at how can we move that needle forward sleep hygiene, but okay. So let's talk a little bit more about the sleep hygiene aspect. Cause this yeah. is actually like newer research, right? Like I feel like more mm -hmm. and more, we're starting to talk about the importance of sleep. Why would someone want to get seven to nine hours of sleep? Like, how does it actually impact their nutrition? Yeah. Well, when people do not get enough sleep, think about this just in general baseline, we don't get enough sleep. How do we feel? We're groggy. Um, we're, we're less able to focus, concentrate, dial in on the tasks that we're doing. We may be more absent-minded. We may be moving slower that day. So we find ourselves playing catch up. We're going to start multitasking. We know when we try to do multiple things at one time, the focus on that one thing and the effort to that one thing that's important decreases, right? So we're not being as mindful and aware and grounded in our present space. Um, and so all those things, you know, coming into play really can result in us making uh, less intentional nutrition choices. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we go to uh, have lunch or going to the refrigerator, say somebody's working at home because, you know, so many of us have shifted you know, to working at home now yeah. since, you know, the pandemic started. So very common for people to be um, leaving their office in their home and, you know, taking a trip down to the kitchen at lunchtime, they stand there with the refrigerator door open, right? Because we can't clearly make those decisions about food because we're just so tired and groggy. Mm -hmm. So chances are, what are we going to reach for? We're going to reach for something that is less desirable to our nutrition plan, maybe something that's not going to serve us as well. 
maybe something that's not going to maybe help regulate the blood sugar that we really need to like a a nice, well-rounded, well-balanced, you know, all three macronutrients there, your carbs, your proteins, your fat, right? We're going to go for that leftover cake in the refrigerator and a nice big glass of milk. We need the Um, energy, right? We need that energy. We need a little pick me up or we're going to have an extra cup of coffee, um, you know, and so now we're reaching for caffeine. So I think one of at baseline, one of the biggest things is that we're just really mentally not 100% on board with making good choices. Um, and, and that, that is probably the number one thing. Um, the, the other thing I think is metabolically what comes into play from like a physiological standpoint is that, you know, you, if you get continuously, you don't get enough sleep. It's going to impact, you know, how, how fast your metabolism is going to work and the different metabolic pathways that come into play. We're going to, um, start seeing our hormone, um, levels shift around our hunger cues, you know, leptin, um, you know, lack of blood sugar control, higher insulin uh, rates over time. And that definitely impacts our result as far as like, are we able to achieve our fitness goals? Where are we carrying our fat? Um, we know that when we don't get the sleep that we need, we are higher, um, stress and that increases our cortisol. Where do women store cortisol? in the abdomen or visceral fat area, right? And that puts women at risk for reproductive diseases, cancers, different things like that. So it can really spiral out of control. Sleep is so important. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say, so it should be like number one, pretty much. Like, I mean, it impacts so many different things. It's so interesting. It's so interesting, like how we really haven't been, like, there's not a lot of, I mean, we're getting better at it, but like before there really wasn't a lot of conversation around like the things that we engage in on a daily basis and how it impacts how we feel. Like, I know so many women, like within my coaching program that like midday, you know, between two and 4 PM or just like the, like this lull after work is when they're feeling really tired. That's when they're more likely to reach for more sugar laden foods, right? Like something, uh, the caffeine, like you mentioned things that really aren't going to be supportive again for a good night's sleep. So it's just, it's this very vicious cycle, but if we don't know the impact that it's having, it's so hard to be able to address it. And so that's where, like, that's where coaching comes in hand, right? Like absolutely, you're, you're able to work with someone that's aware of those modalities and the behaviors that could be impacting how you're ultimately feeling to kind of call them out, call them to consciousness, which helps with our mindset right now. Cause then now we have a different, a completely different view of like, Oh, this is what it means to take care of myself, which can shift the, you know, the, the conversation. So it's not only about the food, right? Like, I mean, right. I mean, as dietitians, like oftentimes, like there is a heavy focus on food, but there's so many different aspects about our lifestyle that impact the foods that we desire. Absolutely. And I call this in my practice. Um, I always tell people when I'm looking to onboard a potential client, I'll let them know, like, this is a four full circle approach to nutrition. It's a full circle, meaning that it's not just about foods. It extends beyond an eat this, don't eat that approach because our life, right. Has so many other variables in it, like so many other so aspects funny. to health besides nutrition and nutrition is impacted so heavily on those other things and vice versa. And we have to start looking at nutrition beyond just, you know, foods that you're eating Two, It's like how we think and how we feel about foods, right? Because that's going to drive our food choices and our food choices are going to drive things like our mood, for example. So it really all comes back full circle. So true. So how do we, So let's just say like, and I'm thinking of like just the clients that I work with, right. Particularly women, right. Like I know that men also struggle with this. Um, but I'll just, I'll just focus on the women. Cause that's, you know, that's who I support. Sure. We have, I feel like so often we've been taught the diet mentality, right. Like goes into the diet mindset. If you have been in that for 20, 30, 40 years plus, like, how do we like start detaching from that when really that's, that has been the only way that we've been taught to care for ourselves. Like what, 
what do you share with that person? Cause I know it's like super fun. I can hear just so many different, you know, voices in my head from coaching clients of like, Jana, this is so hard. Um, what do you share with individuals that, that are, are coming from that space? Well, one is, I think, um, you know, the supportive community is definitely, I mean, you cannot go into this journey without having a supportive community. Uh, one of the questions I always ask people when I get them on a call to see if it's going to be a good fit for my private coaching is what kind of support system do you have at home? Um, and, and do those people that are most important to you know that you want to make this shift in your life and you're going to be starting this journey? Um, and tell me a little bit more about that. And we kind of like open up that conversation because that's something that we need to talk about from the very beginning because we ha- we have to know that Um, We need that support at home, Um, but you're also going to obviously get that support with coaching as well. Mm -hmm. And that, that offers a different kind of support, right? Because we all know that as much as, you know, people at home want to support, sometimes they just don't understand the elements of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's where that coaching comes in, but it's offering that sense of community with other clients and allowing them to collab and communicate and inspire and motivate each other. So it's creating that kind of community. So I think um, that aspect is, you know, super important. And I know that that's very valuable to you in your practice as well. Yeah. And I think that goes into the, like the layers of accountability. So I would say first and foremost, you're accountable to yourself, then you're accountable to others around you. And then last you're accountable to someone that's further along in the process. Mm-hmm. And when we get all three of those to line up, it's a miracle one. It's a miracle. Yes. Um, but that's really where we see the most success. And I will say like, I, I can tell if a woman is going to be successful based on her partner. Mm-hmm. So, and I know that that's like a really bold statement. Um, however, if the partner is not, if they have a partner, if they are not involved in the process or supportive of the process, she likely will not be as well. Versus if the partner is like, I don't know what this is, but I'm like 100% behind you. They right. are so, so successful. So yes, not only do you have to be accountable to yourself, but then that's also where the accountability of others, like what is like, like you said, what is your support system? How are they helping you when days, when you just want to have like your effort days, right? Like this right. doesn't matter. Like that is where other people come in to the picture and say, no, 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 you know, like you're doing good or, you know, whatever that is, like, you know, be your cheerleader so that you can keep going. I think that's so important just from a mindset perspective of it's not like, this is where you can't do it on your own, right? Like you can do it on your own to a certain extent, but this is really where the community aspect and the support aspect is so, so helpful for you to be able to keep going. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And something else I tell um, clients is that, you know, I always use the little term, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, And so we have to kind of like release um, the pressure that we're putting on ourselves, right? Like we know like we are our own worst critic. That's just like human nature. So can we release some of that pressure? Um, And can we just take it day by day, you know, week by week, month by month? I think sometimes when we start out, we want to put like timeframes and limitations on things. I want to say like, you know, um, I want to achieve, you know, I want to lose 30 pounds by X date. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a goal in mind, but, um, being a former Stephen Covey trainer in my former life, um, I, I love, you know, the principles of Stephen Covey and I still live by them every day. And I I help my coaching clients along with them. And he said, keep the end in mind. Very important. He didn't say obsess over the end. Mm -hmm. So, right. So if our focus is only on achieving the goal of the time, we are going to encourage those thoughts that you're talking about to stay, to stick around. It's going to be harder. Yeah, you know, yeah. so can we release that expectation and just let the, our timeline unfold naturally? Um, again, it's great to have a goal, and it depends on what you're working towards, certainly. But can we release the pressure because we become so focused on the end result that we actually can achieve the daily habit? Yes. Oh my God. Yes, it actually. We're so fixated on those thoughts that it prevents us from actually taking action mm-hmm. on, on in the areas that are going to get us the results. 
Hey everyone, it's Jana, and I wanted to interrupt your content real quick to tell you about something that I've been using every single day, Owen Protein Drink. I've been using it for the last year now and absolutely love this product. It's been something that's been so helpful to meet my protein needs, to meet my calorie needs, and to meet my overall nutrition and performance goals. I am super picky when it comes to recommending different products or supplements because I take a whole foods based approach. So I highly encourage you to check this out for yourself. See if you like it. I do have a discount code for you. You can click the link in the show notes below at checkout. You can put Jana M 20 to get 20% off and check it out for yourself. Now back to the episode. But So I hear this a lot too, Amanda, like I hear if I, if I'm not hard on myself or if I accept my body where it is, I'm going to gain more weight or I'm going to be in an even worse situation, you know, three, six months down the line. Mm -hmm. Is that true? So I think, um, it depends on your definition of acceptance. So to me, I, when I, when you you, when you accept, accept something, it's really about accepting. I, I try to say, say like the next challenge or accepting that you aren't all perfect in that moment and accepting that you can move forward. Like I challenge them to think about like the terms that they're using, the, the, the story that they're telling themselves. I don't know mm-hmm. if you're familiar with Brene Brown, mm-hmm. um, but I, I love um, all of her work. And so one of the things that she talks about in her book, Rising Strong, is really that, that the story that we're telling ourselves, and that's our limiting belief. And so what kind of beliefs do they have around the word acceptance? And what does that mean to them? Yeah. Really, um, you know, I mean, we're not encouraging anyone to accept that they should stay in an unhealthy place. Right. You know, um, but can we accept ourselves and, and come from a place of self love and abundance instead of scarcity around that word, you mm-hmm. know, and to me, then can we shift our thoughts around that? Um, and then we st- start to shift our outcomes. Yeah. So it's just really, um, it's important to change the way that we think about that. Yeah. I was like, I always share that acceptance is actually like a rip the bandaid moment. Um, because so often, like, again, this is just from, you know, the individuals that I support is maybe they haven't weighed themselves in years and really haven't seen the number on the scale. And so when they get on the scale for the first time and they see it, now we can actually be in acceptance of who they are right now. And we can see the the totality of the equation to be able to move forward. It's nothing that we need to shame. It's nothing that we need to have guilt about. We are literally accepting the human as they are in this moment. And, and there's so much freedom. It's like, oh, okay. Like I've been like, basically I've been hiding for so long and now I finally get to open up to be able to see what the reality is to, because now we can maneuver, right? Like now we actually have um, a strong foundation. We have a baseline. We know the truth of where we are. And then now we can make accurate goals to be able to right. move forward versus if we don't know, we're just like, you know, they say throwing spaghetti on the wall and hoping that it right. sticks, right? Like yeah. that's what we're doing with goals because we don't know. So it's always so, so helpful to be at, like, that's where we step into the truth and the reality of the person's situation. And that's the hard part. Like that, from a mindset perspective, that's hard. It is hard because acceptance is not complacency. And I think that that's the confusion around that, that term, Um, you know, and so we, and, and that comes from, again, a place of, I always tell my clients, you cannot hate yourself healthy. So if we're thinking that way, right, where, where's our mind shifting to? It's shifting to that negative thought, that negative self-sabotage. Um, it's going down the wrong road. So we really, really need to shift that because acceptance is not complacency. It's just, like you said, you know, information, accepting ourselves for where we're at at this stage so that we can progress forward. I. <laughs> That, that was the, like, I mean, that moment right there, acceptance is not complacency is worth the entire list of this podcast. <laughs> like, <laughs> that is acceptance is not complacency. It's so, so true. It's it, acceptance is allowing us to see where you are so that we can actually begin to move forward. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not saying, okay, well now I'm going to stay here. Love Absolutely. that. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, just being mindful of time. I want to just kind of like sum up all that. I feel like we've had, like, there's just so many like great nuggets that individuals can take with them to really step into that mindset. That's going to keep them strong and, and healthy too, right? Like a healthy mindset, um, that's going to allow them to keep moving forward and, and grow. Is there any, anything else that you'd like to share just as we close here? Two little thoughts that I won't spend a lot of time on, but I want you to think about, um, you can ask yourself these two other things. I find this happens so, so, so often with clients. If we can release these, we can make such better progress and stay consistent in achieving our goals. And that, that is, am I boxing out foods? So often I see people actually boxing up foods. And what I mean by that is, is like, you can only have breakfast foods at breakfast, or you can only have lunch foods at lunch, right? Or these are only snack foods. So can we look at all foods as just food? Can we remove the labels um, and not put them into categories or little silos, if you will? And we can see the possibilities that exist. So it's a mind shift around that. That's what I see a lot happen with clients. And when we make that mindset shift, we do so much better, right? We like we feel less pressure. We meal prep easier. We achieve more consistency with intake. We get more variety. I mean, just so many things start to manifest and happen. The last one I want to mention quickly is possibly my favorite. And this one is, am I telling myself everything in moderation? Um, if there is one thing that we have to release, it's letting go of that saying, everything in moderation, that should not exist within our vocabulary. And the reason why is, um, what does it mean? It's all relative, right? Mm-hmm. And so we can't, we like we literally can't manage anything around that because we can't measure it. Um, and so what, what's moderate to one person is not going to be moderate to another. And also moderate, is not contingent on the actual situation, right? So like if someone brings donuts into your office and you know that eating those donuts aren't something you really even want to do, you're not feeling called out to even enjoy anything like that right now, you're not hungry, by all account, there is no evidence that you should have one of those other than the fact that the person sitting next to you says, hey, girl, everything in moderation. You're like, you know what? Right. Everything in moderation. <laughs> you know what I mean? So how easy is it for us to kind of get caught off guard with that? And it's been around for probably generations. I know in, in my family, I heard I heard it all the time. Oh, Amanda, just, you know, everything in moderation. You know, I'm yeah. like, no. What does that mean? I don't like that term. <laughs> Can we release that? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm like struck here right now. And with that, Amanda, because I feel like I do use, I mean, I've, I've used that. I'm totally guilty of saying that, mm-hmm. um, within my own journey and also, you know, just sharing that with others. But I love how you said that of you know, like our, our brains are not able to land on any one thing of like, what does that actually mean? And everyone, <laughs> everyone's portion sizes are different, right? Like a small scoop, uh, for you could be a really large scoop for me or, you know, whatnot. Like, it's just, it's so, like you said, it's all relative as it always is with nutrition. Mm -hmm, Um, but yeah, I'm going to, I like one, I'm going to have to think about that of how it like shows up, but also I love that. So if we were to define that, then how, how does one move away from that and really be able to define it for themselves? Is it more of like, it, cause what you shared, like in that space or that example with coworkers is more of that, like intuitive eating approach of like, do you actually want that? Um, is that really where you like move your coaching clients or like, how do you address that then? Um, yeah. So we just, we shift the conversation around letting go of number one of the, of everything in moderation. We just really shift ourselves away from that and know that's, that's not something that's going to serve us. So we just stop saying it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, done. Um, <laughs> it's, it's done. It's over. Uh, canceled. Um, and then, um, what we do is you're, you're, you're right on point when you say in- intuitiveness, because I teach a lot of intuitiveness in my practice. Mm-hmm. It's not a hundred percent intuitive eating approach because okay. I help people create boundaries for better balance and, and also focus on weight loss. So can we merge the two? Do we have to live alone? Right. Do we have to live in this uh, over here and over here? Can we merge the two? And so my practice is really all about bringing all those things together because everyone should be in tune, right? But intuitiveness Mm -hmm. actually extends way beyond 
am I hungry or am I full? Right. That's just that's touching the surface right. of what intuitive eating really is. Um, and so it's always like asking ourselves, you know, is this something that I really want to enjoy right now? Or is an out, outside influence coming into play? And a lot of times it's food FOMO, right? Fear of missing out or mm-hmm. pressure, right? From the coworker sitting next to you that tells you again to bring in that moderation comment. So you know, we, we have to use our intuitive nature. We know our body gives us information all the time. So it's our ability to be able to read what our body is telling us and make a good um, informed nutrition choices that we can feel good about. Yeah. Two minutes after, an hour after, later on the day, the next day, right? The goal is that we want to feel good about the things that we're doing um, and then repeat that feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I think yeah. that really just like allows just this, like, as you were speaking, I just really envision like this openness aspect to food. Like it really just allows um, you to navigate food for what it is. It, it's food. It is nourishment. That's it. It It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't have any boundaries to it. And really the individual gets to decide like how, you know, how does it make you feel? Sure. Absolutely. And if you think about it, the everything in moderation um, saying, you know, really comes from a place of diet culture. Um, You know what I mean? And restriction. Why would you even tell yourself everything in moderation? Well, because you feel that you shouldn't have something right? Or that food is bad or off limits. So that really comes from a place of restriction, but that's not where we should, we should live. We should see food as an abundance. And I don't mean like, Hey, just eat anything you want in whatever amount that you want to, at whatever frequency you want to No, we need good balance, you know, boundaries to have good balance in life. And that's with everything in life. Food is no Mm -hmm. different, right? right? So it's not just something that's haphazardly done. It's done with intention it's done with focus, um, you know, and all those things coming together. And, um, and that, and that's why like clients that actually can truly leave the diet culture behind really never return to that saying everything in moderation, because it really doesn't even come into play with them anymore. Yeah. And I think it allows them to just like, I don't know. I I see that as part of like, oftentimes, like when we are in more of a a diet culture mentality, there is an obsessiveness around food and there's just like constant thinking about it. And it Mm -hmm. really overshadows so many other things that we, um, get to enjoy throughout the day. And when we really start peeling that back and saying, you know, it is what it is type, you know, type thing. Now you have so much more brain space to be able to take on all these different avenues that maybe you've been looking, looking or desiring for that. It it almost becomes more quiet yet, yet you're maneuvering it better, which Mm -hmm. is so, so interesting. So I love that. And like I said, like, I am going to have to like, think on that one too, of like how to rework that in so many different ways. So I love that you shared that. Awesome. Uh, well, I feel like one, this is a, this is going to be an episode that people need to listen to like two or three times just to get all the little nuggets that mm-hmm. were shared and really be able to see like, and go through, like, I'm such a huge you know proponent of being able to write things down. Cause one, we have to sit down, <laughs> right? Like in most of the time, like we're just so like, so busy on the go that we don't take right. the time to like, just sit and be, but mm-hmm. two, it helps with bringing those unconscious thoughts to our conscious level and really be able to see them, see all the things that are going through our mind to get, say like, and identify, Oh, I'm thinking this way. Now, how can I really move into that, you know, more open, more abundant mindset that's really going to be helpful and supportive long term? So I really hope that individuals take that time um, to go through everything that you shared as it relates to mindset and being able to, you know, step away from diet culture and really move into a space where it's all relative. And like, how do you feel your best? So I so, 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 so appreciate your time today. Um, yeah, and I know that individuals are going to love this. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's been fun, Jana. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day today to tune in. If you love today's content, leave me a review, letting me know exactly what you liked best. And remember to share my podcast with others to join the newer shoe community. If you want more great content like this between episodes, I encourage you to join my mailing list. You can click the link below in the show notes or check out my website at www.healthwinds.org. And let's stay in touch. Until next time, I'm Jana. Talk soon.